would you think if I told you that from a single test with your athlete, you could do one trial and then calculate the asymmetry and come up with five different potential outcomes for the asymmetry, all for the same metric from one single trial? There are actually at least 10 different ways that we can calculate asymmetry from a single test and a single trial. So clearly, it's vitally important that we understand all these different options, their pros and cons, and most importantly, what we're calculating with our athletes and why. Hi everyone, welcome back to Global Performance Insights. I'm Joe Club, an applied sports scientist, and this video is a continuation of our athlete testing series in collaboration with Volve Performance. This video today is gonna to be all about athlete asymmetries and the calculation conundrum. So what exactly are asymmetries? Well, we're talking about some kind of difference in performance or function within our athletes. Now, there are two main overarching types of asymmetries. We have intra-limb asymmetries and inter-limb asymmetries. Intra-limb, meaning within the limb, is when we're looking at a single side of the body and comparing the strength of the capacity of different muscles within that joint. Generally, I think of these more as imbalances or balance within a limb across the muscles. So for example, in the hip and groin area, we might look at the adductor-abductor ratio. So with Vold's force frame, for example, we can measure the force capacity in an isometric prone position during abduction versus adduction. We get a left-sided ratio and the right-sided ratio comparing the intra-limb asymmetry. And this is particularly common in ice hockey athletes, but of course any athletes where hips and groin injuries are prevalent, particularly kicking athletes given the asymmetrical demands of those kinds of sports can be really relevant. So for more on that, check out my video on hip and groin testing earlier in the series. Another example for you, moving up the body could be in the shoulder. We might also use the force frame to look at external rotation strength against internal rotation strength. So then we can look at the ER-IR ratio. Again, one on each side. These capacities and looking at the imbalances within the joint will be relevant for our overhead athletes, particularly those who have throwing demands. So again, I have a video talking about shoulder testing as well, if you want to check that one out. But probably more commonly when we think about asymmetries, we are naturally thinking about inter-limb asymmetry. Inter meaning between, so comparing left and right in some way. We might do this either in a bilateral movement, whereby both limbs are in demand at the same time. There's lots of different options for this, but let's use this example of a counter movement jump here in which we are using our four steps from valve performance. And because four steps is a dual force platform, we can analyze the left and the right side separately. Now, just a note on that. If you want to learn more about force plates and how they work, I have another video in this series on that as well. So that could be worth checking out. We might also look at unilateral kind of jumps. So perhaps single leg counter movement jumps to more directly compare the performance of the different limbs in a more isolated manner. Now the different nature of these types of tests, bilateral against unilateral, is really important to consider and has an impact on how we think about asymmetries. I'd recommend having a look at this publication. It's an article that Dan Cohen wrote for the Aspatar Journal about how unilateral tests are not necessarily just half of the apple. If we consider in our bilateral tests, so for instance, a counter movement jump, we can have much greater movement velocity in these demands by using both of our limbs. And so if we want to hone in on our isolated capacity of our different limbs, then really we should be looking at them in isolation, looking at some form of unilateral test. 
the bilateral tests then provide a better way of assessing the compensation strategies. It's not necessarily just the left side plus the right side added together, but they give us some insight that when we have use of both of our limbs, how do the athletes use them to get the best outcome? And this can be really insightful from a compensation strategy perspective. So it's not necessarily better or worse, but there are different purposes of using a bilateral test against a unilateral test. Once we then have our test data, we're looking to calculate the asymmetry that our athlete is displaying. And this is where it gets really interesting because there's surprisingly a high number of different ways that we can calculate it. So let's take a look at what has been labeled the calculation conundrum. We cannot, of course, talk about athlete asymmetries without mentioning Dr. Chris Bishop from Middlesex University. His PhD is really the go-to resource on all things asymmetries. And you can find all of his publications on his research page here. So definitely look up some of these resources. It was Chris, along with his colleagues in this publication that first coined the term, the calculation conundrum. So let's take a closer look at the different equations and some of the examples discussed in the literature. So here we have a table of our 10 different equations along with the citation. This is taken from a blog post that Chris kindly provided to my site, Global Performance Insights. I will link to that below so that you can access that article and all these references in more detail at any time that you would like. Let's now illustrate each of these with an example. So in this case, we have an athlete who is a right-sided dominant player who has a, say, a force score of 800 on the right and a force score of 700 newtons on the left. Remember, that's being their non-dominant limb. So let's walk through these examples then, starting with our limb symmetry index number one. This is actually technically a measure of symmetry rather than asymmetry. We can see that the outcome or this example would be 87.5. That is the reverse of what we're used to seeing in terms of the asymmetry and saying, actually, there's a symmetrical calculation of 87.5. So that's kind of the odd one out in this group. If we actually zoom back now and look at the asymmetry examples calculated here, we can see that there's some certainly some differences, but there's also some similarities. And some of these different equations are giving us the same output. So what I've actually done here is rearrange this table into group the different equations that give us the same output. So we can move to our top group here, all giving us with this example, 12.5%. And that is the limb symmetry index two, Franco Impelizari's bilateral strength asymmetry, and Chris himself, Bishop et al, with the standard percentage difference can see all slightly different approaches, some using the highest against the lowest, so strong or weak or max or min, and then limb symmetry index two using dominant versus non-dominant. Yes, that's the first key take home here is that it's important to consider if we're using dominance or non-dominance. Certainly in a kicking sport where that may be obvious, it may be a really meaningful piece of context for us, but perhaps not all sports do have a dominant limb. So that obviously is an important consideration for how we are calculating them. So our next group is giving us with this example, a slightly a similar, but slightly different, slightly higher asymmetry percentage of 13.3. Bishop's group in that paper actually advise against the limb symmetry index three because it is using left to right rather than dominant versus non-dominant. In our next group, we see a much smaller asymmetry calculated with the bilateral asymmetry index one and the symmetry index giving us 6.7% difference. In the publication, Bishop and colleagues write about how high or low or max and min can obviously change sides over time with your athletes. It's not necessarily always the same. So there is a danger there of losing context if you are continually flipping between which side is kind of that reference point, which is again why they lean strongly towards 
using a fixed reference point of leg dominance. Now, finally, this symmetry angle is quite frankly, a completely different approach. Interestingly here, it gives us our lowest asymmetry percent difference of 4.2. And again, if we're thinking about that reference score I just mentioned, this approach really benefits from not needing a reference value, given those limitations that we discussed about using either dominance or max and min. So here's the illustration from Chris's paper for this approach, which shows that if we consider two identical values plotted on a matrix, then they would create this vector in relation to the x-axis, which in this case would be a 45 degree angle in relation to the x-axis. So these values would then be to convert it into a percentage with, of course, a perfect symmetry being reflected as 0%. So there we have 10 different equations for calculating asymmetry, of which they provide five different outcomes. Naturally, of course, our next question is, which one is right? And this is really interesting to explore. In that initial calculation conundrum paper, Bishop and colleagues actually vouched most strongly for the symmetry angle. However, they have had a publication since, which has gone through these equations again and illustrated how a different approach is needed whether we are using a bilateral test or a unilateral test. So let's take a look at these examples. Forstex, the world's fastest, easiest, and most powerful dual force plate system. Assess physical performance in seconds. Jump, land, squat, push, pull, and more. Forstex automatically analyzes more than 20 common tests. You can even record video, which is automatically synced with your force data. Then find all your data and reports in one place. Vault Hub, including integrated norms based on millions of data points, helping give context to your athletes' results. And it's not just Forstex. You'll find all your Vault data in Vault Hub. One login, all of your performance data. Welcome to Vault. So in this publication, again from Chris Bishop and his group, which I will also link to below, they propose that the most suitable equation depends on the task. Think back to what we spoke about earlier, whereby the bilateral demands allow you to generate more velocity, allow you obviously to generate more power, uh, more strength. And so they are better for looking at the compensation strategies between limb when the athlete is moving as a whole. Arguably, that is more, most relevant to perhaps how they might move on the field of play. Whereas, again, the unilateral tests have their purpose, they have a benefit, and that is trying to assess in an isolated fashion the capacities of a single limb. So for these reasons, we need to calculate asymmetry differently when the limbs are acting together. If it is a bilateral movement, then the asymmetry should be expressed relative to the total output. Again, this is because both limbs are interacting together and it can really highlight how one side may compensate for the other within this bilateral demand. So if we return to our examples from earlier, in this case, Bishop and his colleagues recommend for bilateral tests using this group of equations, either the bilateral asymmetry index one or the symmetry index. Bear in mind that Chris and his colleagues express caution about using high and low because that can flip sides and therefore that context is lost. They actually recommend using this dominant non-dominant approach and therefore the bilateral asymmetry index one. And with this example, it's interesting because it's one of the examples that are on the lower end of the scale. We're seeing a 6.7% asymmetry between the left and right side during, for example, a counter movement jump. Whereas the single limb test, remember, we don't have a total to compare it to. We are not looking at the contribution of left and right side to that total. So we want to compare these side by side. So they recommend with these unilateral tests using either the bilateral strength asymmetry or the standard percent difference 
In this case, we are comparing the difference in the separate limb capacities using the stronger side as our reference value. I know this can get a bit confusing to wrap your head around, so perhaps it would be best walking through another example. Now, let's take another look at Chris's paper and the couple of case studies that they propose for these calculations. So in this case, we have the counter movement jump with the left limb's force producing around 405 newtons. The right limb is producing 556.61 newtons. So with this example, we get a total of 961.73 newtons as the sum force of the propulsive phase of the jump. So when each side then are divided into that total of 961 and then multiplied by 100, we get 57.88% uh, of the force being performed by the right side and 42.12% of the force being performed by the left side. And that means that the difference between the limbs is 151.49 newtons. So when we divide this amount into the total of the sum force and then multiply it by 100, we get an asymmetry of 15.75%. That technically then is the correct outcome for asymmetry during this trial. 15.75%. So in this table, Bishop and colleagues demonstrate the different asymmetries that they produce. As we discussed earlier, that it is during a bilateral test, the bilateral asymmetry index one calculation that gives us our correct outcome. Now let's look at their example for a single leg counter movement jump. Remember, we are comparing the limbs side by side to each other. There is no total force as we have with the bilateral example to compare to. So in this example, the right-sided single leg counter movement jump is giving us 679.69 newtons and the left side is giving us 397.76 newtons force generated. So the percent difference between these two values is 41.48%. And we can see here in this percent difference, which expresses the difference between these values, both as fractions of 100%, we then get our correct asymmetry percent between these values as 41.48%. So again, they have used the same four equations as in the previous example with the bilateral counter movement jump to illustrate the different asymmetry scores you would get. And in this case, we can see with these unilateral tests that the correct asymmetry of 41.48% is calculated by the bilateral strength asymmetry. Or of course, we could use that standard percent difference that we just saw. Those are the two equations that are recommended for comparing unilateral tests. Franco Pelizzari's bilateral strength asymmetry or Chris's citation of just the standard percentage difference calculation. Okay, I hope that all makes sense. As I said, there's plenty of resources below, whether it's to the blog post on Global Performance Insights or to Chris's research publications that go through this that you can refer back to. I think it's really interesting to consider that we should be using different asymmetry calculations depending on whether we're using a bilateral test or a unilateral test. But having gone through it myself, it certainly makes sense to me and I really hope it does for you as well. The last point I want to make on this, because it does, does relate to the calculation of asymmetry, is accounting for the direction. So as we've mentioned during this video, the direction of the asymmetry can change over time. Sometimes an athlete might have their left side stronger than their right side. Likewise, if you're using dominance against non-dominance, at times the non-dominant limb can be stronger than the dominant limb. So it's important that that context doesn't get lost when we're looking at athletes, either comparing athletes across a group, but also critically looking at athletes over time. So again, I rely on Chris's expertise here, and he recommends that making the dominant side always a positive number and making the non-dominant side a negative number. So in the case of using Excel, 
we can simply do this with this if statement. So here, any asymmetry whereby the dominant side is greater will remain as a positive number. But if in the case, the non-dominant side is actually stronger than the dominant side, then it will become a negative number. And that allows you to plot athletes, either a group of athletes on an axis like this, but also to track that over time. I think here is where the data visualization becomes really critical. I also at times like to use left and right side in terms of them plotting it on the left and the right side of a bar graph. As we know with data visualization, anytime we can make it more intuitive, more natural to understand will be a benefit to the reader. Of course, there's a lot more we could get into on that specific topic, but I think we'll save that then for another video. In summary, there are an array of asymmetry calculations available for you to use with your testing data from your athletes. It's important for you to know the strengths and weaknesses, which calculation you are using and whether that is actually the most relevant to the task the athletes are doing. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, then please hit subscribe so you don't miss another Sports Science Insight video coming up soon. And thanks again to Val Performance for sponsoring this video and the whole athlete testing series that you can find on the Global Performance Insights YouTube channel.